if you would all join us in worship as Claudia begins with our prelude. Good morning, Desert Palm. Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful fall morning. Thank you, Claudia, for that gorgeous jazz rendition of Jesus Loves Me. I think I can honestly say that's the most beautiful version of Jesus Loves Me I've ever heard. Yeah, let's hear it for Claudia. We're celebrating and acknowledging Children's Sabbath today. Um, You know, we're celebrating our youth, and we've got our youth are going to be helping us out. Um, And we're also taking taking some time to ponder just the the plight of our children nationally and around the world. Um, That's really sort of the backdrop of of where I'll I'll be going today. Um, I just want to to invoke some energy around Children's Sabbath, which is actually a, you know, as as we'll be hearing, it's a very serious interfaith. Um, national and worldwide effort to um, help us connect to the suffering of kids. And so I just want to put this in perspective. This is from the Children's Defense Fund. They're the ones who coordinate this every year. And they put it this way, we stand at a vital moment of crisis and challenge for our children and youth and our nation. The pandemic now in its second year 
has broken hearts, dashed dreams, cost families their homes, health, education, security, celebrations, ritual, and routines. You know, we, we forget how much we've lost. And I just have to say, it feels so great to be here with folks physically present and to know that others are, are watching. So we've been through a lot. There's been the, the national reckoning with racism, white supremacy, this is their statement, over-policing, police killing of unarmed black and brown children, youth, and adults. This has all been traumatic. So to really do Children's Sabbath, we got to take a breath and recognize, you know, these have really been traumatic times for, for our youth and, and for all of us. Each of these challenges has surfaced and exacerbated mental health challenges that oftentimes were already going unmet. How a child, youth, parent, or other adult has experienced the past year varies dramatically by age, family, location, circumstance. And they conclude this way, and this is why I'm reading it, I think it's really important. The only way we will know what is true for our children hit hardest is by asking them, where does it hurt? Then listening attentively. Only by asking where it hurts and listening deeply will we be guided by those who feel the pain to know how to help, how to promote healing, and how to prevent further harm. So that's from the Children's Defense Fund. And secondly, we're also celebrating Laity Sunday, which I confessed to Mark I had been spelling wrong and everything I had been sending him, Mark Aston. I thought it was L-A-Y-I-T-Y. Um, there's no Y in the beginning, L-A-I-T-Y. Um, and that got me on a, a, a verbal etymological wild goose chase. And I found it's from Laos, from the Greek, you know, of the people. So, you know, we use laity to say people who are not ordained, um, although within the UCC we celebrate that we're all called. There's a, a baptismal call and an apostolic call. And the baptism, baptismal call is something that we all experience, lay or, or ordained. But today, because it's Lady Sunday, we, we celebrate our non-ordained folks, all the amazing work you all are doing. So my proverbial hat is off to you all um, because I am seriously super grateful for all the moving parts of the church, um, the councils and the committees and all that's happening, driven and guided by the wisdom of our laity. So thank you folks for that. I'm just going to give you a little teaser here and say that Daniel has pre-recorded a beautiful song. Chloe is with us to sing a gorgeous song from Moana. Um, uh, awesome film, if you haven't seen it, animated film. And now we have a, a pre-recorded reading that relates to Children's Sabbath. And then I'm going to invite a couple of our kids, our youth, up uh, to light some candles. Good morning. We light our candles today in celebration of Children's Sabbath, a multi-faith movement that engages places of worship across the country in focusing prayers, worship, edu worship education programs, and action to help us learn more about the urgent problems facing our, nation, our nation's children. We do this by exploring sacred texts and teachings that call us to love and protect children, responding with outreach and advocacy, and most importantly, inspiring new year-round action to improve the lives of children. And now I will invite Chloe and Antonia up to light our candles.
The Gospel reading this morning is from Mark 10, verse 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Thus ends our reading. Thank you, Miriam. I'm going to begin with a fairy tale today. In relation to all that's going on in the world, I think we really need to go deep into our 
mythological collective wisdom. So this is, this is a, an ancient tale. Once upon a time, there was an old woodcutter who worked from early morning till late at night. When he had finally saved a little money, he said to his son, you're my only child. I've made a little money by the sweat of my brow, and I'm going to spend it on your education. If you learn some decent trade, you'll be able to take care of me in my old age, when my limbs are stiff and I must sit at home. The boy went to the university and studied hard. The teachers praised him, and he stayed for a while. When he had almost completed his courses, his father's meager savings were finished, and he had to return home. It's a shame, said his father sadly. I have no more to give you, and these are hard times. I can barely earn what's needed for our daily bread. Father, said the son, don't worry. I'll get used to this life, and maybe I'll be the better for it in the end. Then as the father was preparing to go out and earn more money, cutting and piling firewood, the son said, I'll come along and help you. I don't know, said the father. It might be hard on you. You're not used to heavy work. I doubt if you could stand it. Besides, I've only one ax and no money to buy another. Go ahead and ask your neighbor, said the son. He'll let you have an ax until I've earned enough money to buy another one. So the father borrowed an ax from the neighbor. And the next morning, they went to the forest together. The young fellow helped his father and was cheerful as could be. When the sun was high in the sky, the father said, let's rest a little while now and have something to eat. The son took his bread and said, you rest, father. I'm not really tired. I'm going to take a little walk. Don't be a fool, said the father. What's the good of running around? Afterwards, you'll be tired, too, too tired to work. Stay here and sit down. But the son went deeper into the forest. He felt light and happy and looked up into the green branches to see if he could find a bird's nest. Back and forth he walked, and at last he came to a big, angry-looking oak tree that must have been hundreds of years old and was so thick that five people could not wrap their arms around the base of the trunk. He stopped, looked at the tree, and thought, lots of birds must have built their nests here. Suddenly he heard someone calling. A muffled voice was calling, let me out, let me out. He looked around and he couldn't see anything, but he thought the voice was coming from the ground. Where are you, he cried. The voice answered, I'm in among the roots of the oak tree. Let me out. The young man cleared away the dead leaves and looked among the roots until finally he uncovered a small hollow and found a little glass bottle. When he held the bottle up to the light, he saw something that was shaped like a frog jumping up and down inside the bottle. Let me out, let me out, it kept crying. Suspecting no harm, the student pulled the cork off the bottle. And in a flash, a spirit slipped out and began to grow. And it grew so fast that in seconds, a monstrous fellow, half as big as a tree, was standing there. In a thundering voice, he said, Do you know what your reward will be for venturing into the forest and setting me free? No, said the young man. How could I? Then I'll tell you, cried the spirit. I'm going to break your neck. You should have told me that before, <laughs> said the student. I'd have left you in the bottle. <laughs> but I'll keep my head all the same. You'll have to consult a few more people before I let you tamper with my neck. You know, he sounds like a smart, smart young man, right? More people indeed, said the spirits. Do you think they've kept me shut up in here all this time out of kindness? They did it to punish me. I am the mighty Mercurius, and when somebody sets me free, it's my duty to break his neck. Not so fast, said the student. First, I have to know that you were really in that bottle. Then I'll believe that you were the mighty Mercurius. Nothing could be simpler, said the spirit, whereupon he made himself tiny and jumped back in the bottle, at which point the student put the cork back on. <laughs> The spirit had been outsmarted. The young man started walking back to his father. 
But the spirit cried again. Please let me out. No, said the young man, you can't fool me twice. When I catch somebody who has threatened my life, I don't let him go off easily. If you set me free, said the spirit, I will give it you enough to last you as long as you live. Hmm. No, said the student, you're just going to cheat me again. And the spirit said, you're turning your back on a good fortune. I won't hurt you. I promise you will be richly rewarded. The young man thought to himself, I'll take my chance. Maybe he'll keep his word. So he pulled out the cork and the spirit came out as he had the first time and stretched and spread until he was as big as a giant. And then he handed the student a piece of cloth and said, this is your reward. If you put one end of this on any wound, it shall be healed. And if you take the other end and you touch any metal object, it will turn to silver. I have to try that, said the young man. He, he took the ax and he gashed the bark of a tree and then he rubbed it with the cloth. And the bark grew back together, magically healed. It's all right, said the man. Now we can part. The spirit thanked him for setting him free. And the student thanked Mercurius for the gift and went back to his father. The story continues from there and it's quite fascinating. He goes on to become a great doctor, this young man. So, I, I'm telling this story for a reason, and, and the, the reason is I, I think it is a, a powerful reminder of the wisdom of children, of, of the younger generations coming up. I mean, I'm looking around me, and I know we have a lot of wise elders here, and so you all know that out of the mouths of babes, right, that there is tremendous wisdom. I mean. What did Jesus say is the key to entering the kingdom of God? He brought a child in and he said, we have to become like this. So in that story, you know, the father is saying to the son, stay here, you know, don't, don't overdo it. But he says, no, I must go deeper into the forest. So here at Desert Palm, we have long prioritized our, our children. You know, we've had two mission imperatives, as far as I can tell, children and the homeless, two extremely vulnerable populations in our society. And we, we take our work with our kids seriously. Um, you know, I'm so grateful to have been able to work with Mike Land and to have seen the, our program thriving pre-pandemic on all cylinders, you know, with religious education, confirmation, vacation Bible school. And I'm equally excited to be working with Andrew as we look forward to this post-pandemic time. I, I'll just give a little plug for our outdoor Thanksgiving gathering. Um, and then we're gonna be having a big brainstorming session. Mark Williams, our new moderator, is putting together a new five-year visioning plan. We're going to be doing some brainstorming, and we're going to be uh, moving into the, the next chapter in the life of the church, and I'm so excited about that. Today is also Laity Sunday. As, as I said, um, I mentioned that I, I had been misspelling it, which brought me into the Greek and a curiosity about this word. Laos, of the people. Of course, those of you who've been active in our programs know full well if you dropped in on any of the VBSs in the past 40 some odd years and you look to see who's teaching those classes, you know, it's, it's, it's lady, it's all the volunteers. Um, I just have to say it's such an honor to be serving a church with so many awesome, powerful people. It's hard to say laity because half of you are retired clergy, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know, I mean, the folks other than, than me and, and Mark and Andrew, our, our governance style, you know, we never talk about these things, but it's so 
important. You know, all of our committees, the way it functions is so impressive, so powerful. Even as we say, okay, you know, this is the way we've always done it. How might we fine tune this and hone it and make adjustments as we enter into um, the, the next chapter in, in the life of the church? You all, some of you all are aware that I've been studying community psychology, um, which is sort of an outgrowth of organizational psychology. You know, you look at the Ford Motor Company and you say, you know, how can we improve, uh, improve productivity? You know, that's kind of organizational psychology. And community psychology is saying, looking at any community, for example, the Desert Pond community, and saying, how can we be more powerful, more effective? How can we make a bigger splash in the world with our message, with the things that we care about? So it's, it's really almost synonymous with grassroots social justice organizing. One of the key notions, and I say this intentionally in relation to uh, Lady Sunday, is this, the value, really, it's more than a notion, it's a value of inclusion. It's the idea that the whole community is important and necessary, essential, to do the work that we want to do. It's the whole life cycle. It's everybody at every, at every stage. Adrienne Marie Brown, who, uh, whose work I really like and admire, she's super compelling. You can just Google her um, and, and get like a, she wrote a book called Emergent Strategies that activists all over the world are using. And in her YouTube, she's so cool, she's so down to earth. She just says, you know, you can get my book and read it all, and I highly recommend that, you know. But if you just want to go to the two pages that sum everything up, that's like on page 46. And basically what I'm saying is this, you know, and she's talking about the emergent nature of reality and that if we're going to work for change, we need to be tuned into what is emerging within us, within our communities. So one of the things she says, and I just love this, is uh, she's done all this, you know, earth-shaking organizing, but there's a simplicity and a peace and a calm to the work that she does. And she says, when you put out an invite and you gather a group to do anti-racism work, um, you know, Me Too movement work, ecological, environmental justice work, whoever shows up are the people who need to be there. So it, it's, it's a step beyond we got to include everybody and invite everyone. It's saying when people show up, you are the people who are called to be here in this moment. At every level of our activity in church work, it's really a beautiful and fascinating idea. Last week, we had a new family visiting. They're not here today, which is good, so I'm not, I won't embarrass them. But they're going to be back because they were checking us out because they heard we were an LGBT-friendly church, and they, they want to um, have their boys baptized. Um, and the mom's name was Robin. There was two boys. I forget one of them. Um, but the other boy was named Job. And I was like, Wow. You know, that I can remember, <laughs> even with my memory, you know. Um, and I, I said to him, I was like, wow, that is so cool. I have never met anybody named Job before, you know. And it just so happens, one of our, our lectionary readings today is the grand finale of the book of Job. You know, this is the accumulated wisdom of the Western religious tradition on the nature of suffering. And God knows we have experienced a lot of suffering these past few years, right? So we had Job visit us last week. We're going to hear what Job heard from the whirlwind today. We didn't read the scripture uh, because I, I just wanted to read this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens my counsel without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, for I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? 
Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know Job. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or where were its foundations sunk? Who laid the cornerstone of the earth five billion years ago? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds? Can you send forth lightning? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? I think it's so interesting here that at this deepest moment of questioning, why, 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 God says, look how vast it all is. It is so amazing. And you, Job, are a very small part of something larger. When, when, when we muster the spiritual and existential courage to step out of our small little things that we worry about, you know, we are reminded that we are single notes in God's great symphony. It's like standing before the Grand Canyon. It just calms you, right? We all need to be reminded of this at times that it's, it's not about me, especially as we change and try new things. I, I don't like this, you know? Okay, that's fine, you know? We, we need to talk about what we like and what we don't like, but it's not about what any one of us likes or doesn't like. We are evolving, right? We're like the butterfly. We are transforming, and we need to let that energy blossom. Another bit of wisdom from our biblical revelation, I talked about Jesus bringing a child into the midst, is that our kids in, some, in many ways are ahead of us. You know, regardless of the age they are, you know, they can call us on our stuff, they can challenge us, you know, and, and whether it's your own biological kids or not, um, it, just the younger generation. I was having a little chat with Cheyenne in the parking lot and I walked away thinking like, wow, what a profound mind she has. <laughs> she, got, she got me thinking. You know, we'll be reminded of this in Advent, right? We talk about, we read that passage from Isaiah, a little child shall lead them. I mean, it's not easy to, to surrender control, to, to listen to the, the folks that are coming up. And so it is on this children's Sabbath, when we do our best to step out of our small constraints, to open to the beauty and the wonder of the world. We're, we're gonna let our kids lead us, Chloe, our, our youth, I should say. Um, Chloe's gonna sing us a number, and uh, can I just ask a show of hands, how many people have seen Moana, the animated film? Okay, well, just so you know what you're getting into here, um, the, the main character, and maybe I could put Chloe on the spot and ask her to summarize it, but um, do you want to tell them what the film's about, Chloe? Yeah, yeah, grab the mic, and then we'll, leak, we'll go right into your number. Um, Moana is about a girl in her village who wants to learn more about her ancestors and um, the ocean and goes on an adventure to save her um, island from some sort of natural disaster that was going to happen. Um, okay, thanks. And, and one part of the film that's helpful to understand this song is that they have these big, beautiful boats, but they're kept in a cave. And she, am, I'm still on the right film, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> these things start to blend together after a while, you know. Um, it's kind of like the whale rider, if anybody's seen that one. But they, she wants to take these boats out, and there's a fear of going beyond the breakers. Everybody wants to stay on the island. But Moana is so brave, and, and she wants to go beyond the breakers out into the open sea. 
That's what this song is about. Awesome, I gotta see that again. We're entering our time of uh, collective prayer here, and I just wanna say, you know, one of the many changes that we've made is instead of doing joys and concerns um, here on Sunday morning, we're doing that Wednesday morning at 11. Um, and fluctuation, you know, attendance of, of that virtual group has waxed and waned, and I know it's complicated with, depending on where your schedule is, but I just want to remind folks of part of this transition that we're caught up in um, with hybrid worship involves um, doing some group activities. So Monday night, supportive conversation is just really a general check-in, um, and it's a time to share what's on your mind, and everybody gets a chance to speak. Ray... Um, Littleford, Ellen Colangelo, and myself, we take turns um, coordinating that. Mark Gaston and I are taking turns with Wednesday morning, um, and that's where we intentionally share joys and concerns, and some of those joys and concerns um, are, are raised Sunday morning. Um, a few that I'm mindful of, um, Steve Megley's here and gave me an update on Cassie, who's doing much better, um, so we're, we're happy to hear about that. Um, Carol Lee, uh, some of you, I think, probably got a word through their prayer chain that she went to the hospital last night. She's, she's um, been battling some health issues, and uh, it's looking pretty good, and she's probably going to come home today, although we definitely want to keep her in our, in our prayers. And I believe Ken Nordstrom's doing better, Lori's brother. Awesome. Great. So those are 
some of the joys and concerns that I'm aware of. All right, let's join together for a time of prayer. Creator God, on this Children's Sabbath, we give thanks for our youth and our children, for the wisdom of our biblical revelation that a child shall lead them, that unless we become like children, open with awe and wonder to the beauty all around us so that we cannot enter the spiritual dimension of life in all its depth. So we pray that you lead us to those sources, whether it's a beautiful animated film or a book or poetry or music or nonfiction, whatever it is that helps us re-enter the world to enter the chant, to become enchanted with life's spiritual depths. And we just give thanks for our kids, for their sacred lives, for their journeys, their wisdom, their struggles. We ask your blessing upon the, the younger generation. We do lift up, Lord, those folks that we are especially mindful of, holding Carol Lee, Ken Nordstrom, Phil Zeilinger, Cassie, Marlene, in your healing light. These are just a few of the names, Lord. You know the names that we hold in the silent chambers of our heart. We ask you for an outpouring of your love on all of these folks. Lord, we lift up the world as we battle the pandemic. We pray for those who are suffering with it, those who are providing care and comfort, trying to get the vaccine out to more and more people. Pray for that effort. We ask your blessing upon the church, Lord, on our gathering to celebrate Don Beaver's life that's coming up on Saturday, on our gathering in November, where we hope to just bring more people back together so that we can see each other and marvel at how our kids have grown and share some stories and be reminded that we are a living community, that we are the body of Christ. Now, Lord, hear our prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, our mother and father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a postlude now. I'm not sure if it's live. We're all going to stand to sing Holly, Holly, Holly. Oh, we're going to do Holly, Holly. All right. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 